Hi, I'm Adam Rothstein, and I'm going to present my paper, Water Infrastructure Aesthetics. So, Lucy Lippard, in her book Undermining, constructs a fantastic definition of land art, although she does it in the negative by describing features of a set of specific works and then listing comparisons and contrasts between them. I'm not going to read the whole quote, but just to be clear, the works that she's referring to are Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty, Nancy Holt's Sun Tunnels, Walter De Maria's Lightning Field, Charles Ross's Star Axis, James Terrell's Roden Crater, Michael Heiser's Double Negative, and City Complex. So instead of reading the whole quote, I can sum up what she says about these works. She says that all of the artists are white, all but one of them are men, she notes that it's rare for women artists, such as Nancy Holt, to raise the thousands of dollars required to create such work. Three of the works focus on the heavens. Three have been under construction for some 30 years. One has been changed constantly by nature during its 40-year existence. All are endowed by extraordinarily beautiful surroundings and enhanced by weather seasons, light, and shadow. They surrender scale to the adjacent spaces while drawing their emotional power from distance. And distance, she's describing as distance from people, from environmental issues, and even from places, which is going to be an important concept for me in a minute, this distance. Um, she elaborates on that by saying land art tends to be site-specific but not overtly place-specific, i.e. local geology, history, and identity are secondary, if acknowledged at all. And the on-site viewer is as likely to be deeply affected by the landscape as by the art object. So th this is quite a way to define a genre of art. Obviously, these terms aren't all uh, absolutely exclusive. Some apply to some works, some apply to other works. But these describe fairly well what we see when we see land art, given the works that she's considering. These are things that any person should ideally want to conclude after apprehending any piece of land art. They aren't questions exactly, but they are answers to what are surely good questions that Lippert is asking herself as she reflects in her text. And from these answers, we might backtrack to formulate a series of questions. So, if looking at a piece of land art we might ask ourselves and reach similar responses as Lippard, what does this art have to say about race, about gender, capital, relationships of the work's particular function to our general theory of larger systems? What does this art say about the effects of time on construction and destruction? How does the appearance of the site increase our understanding of these issues? And how does it reduce our understanding of these issues? How does the site system resist connection to local ecosystems, and how does it connect to local ecosystems, intended or otherwise? And uh, certainly we could ask other questions, but this is a good, a good way to sort of sum up the sort of conclusions that Lippert is forming when she thinks about land art. And it's not, not only a good way to think about land art, this is also a great start for thinking about infrastructure as well. So let's ask the same series of questions again. What does this infrastructure have to say about race, gender, capital, relationship of the particulars function to our general theory of systems, the effect of time on construction and destruction? How does the appearance of the site increase our understanding or decrease our understanding? How does the site resist connection with ecosystems or connect with ecosystems? And, you know, this is only the beginning. So we should dig a little deeper into how Lippard gets to the point of asking these kinds of questions, or at least answering these kinds of questions. It has to do with that term distance, not just as a physical measurement, but as a separation between oneself and what one is looking at. It's about how things exist together in, in a space, and it's crucial to thinking about land art via Lippard's description, and it will be crucial to thinking about infrastructure in this paper. So distance, as I would term what Lippert had to say, is the, the experience of a breakage and then simultaneously a reconnection. 
With infrastructure, the most apparent distance is that between disparate systems. We think about infrastructure as technology that acts to connect the world, not something that creates distant with distance within it. But infrastructure is just as much about walls as it is pipes. Our world is not just shaped by what we can access, as it is by what we don't need to access or can't access. One of the most important systems infrastructure connects to and disconnects from is nature. Infrastructure alters the established channels of nature, carving roads across mountain ranges and damming up its canyons. Natural passages and breakages are revised, engineered, and economized for quantitative benefit. We often think of technology as a system that acts only to separate human experience from natural ecosystems, but this isn't quite true. Infrastructure does not purely separate so much as it redesigns the interaction of the nature and human according to a particular theory of how that interaction ought to function, a specific interaction designed according to a larger, more general system. Technology today is permanently altering ecosystems in this way, a phenomenon so widespread that we are largely comfortable pronouncing the scale of this effect as geologic and naming it the Anthropocene. But for every broken connection, new ones are forged. And while the biological, ethical, and historical consequences of these changes are often dire if not cataclysmic, the aesthetic experience of this alteration is nevertheless becoming a defining feature of our understanding of the Earth, and therefore is attracting our attention specifically. The aesthetics of the anthropocenic infrastructure is built from an experience of the disconnection and reconnection of systems. Not just a physical distance, but a redesign of systems apprehended aesthetically as guided composite interaction. It might be between humans and nature, humans and machines, between capital and humans, between races and culture, or between gender and nature. Any interaction of systems, material, ideal, cultural, or artistic, can leave us feeling the sense of a design disconnection and reconnection. In the context of land art and infrastructure sites, most of the interactions involve the material and the natural, but they don't have to be strictly these categories. As we feel any difference brought on by the site, we are driven to ask questions about it, attempting to describe it. The issues that Lippard notes in her description of land art, the, these issues of emotional power, cultural importance, environmental stewardship, capitalism, and racial and gender politics are diverse and wide-ranging, but they are also as crucial and critical to issues of ongoing orientation as we should expect from our analysis of physical space. Through her answers outlining the extremities of a concept of land art, we find clues toward the central mechanism, from the kernel which points the experience, uh, from the or sorry, from the kernel of which point the experience was generated that brought on these questions. It is this emanating distance which both disconnects and reconnects the specificities of the site that we ought to pay attention to to connect and also disconnect us from our own understanding of the site. The larger context of these sites in Lippard's work and this paper focusing on infrastructure is the so-called American West, which as a nominal zone of inquiry deserves an official disconnection and reconnection to our understanding of it. So to that end, when we say American West, we mean the land between the arbitrary line denoted in the north by the International Orders Survey of 1872 to 1876, run by British and American surveyors to establish the border with Canada, and the similar line negotiated in the South by the 1884 border convention between the governments of Mexico and the United States. On the western edge is the lovely, aesthetically pleasing border of the Pacific Ocean, which even now is encroaching eastward with the help of climate change. And the eastern boundary is, with no real need for specificity, somewhere between the Mississippi River and the Great Divide and the Rocky Mountains. The American West is an interesting place, no doubt, although whether it is objectively more interesting than any other similarly large area of Earth is questionable. And yet the American West is unique. <clears throat> 
like any place on Earth, with features and problems different from any other region. One feature of the American West, which this paper will egocentrically abbreviate to the West, currently making the news, is its uh, complicated relationship with the water. <clears throat> Incredibly interesting books have been written in detail on this topic, such as Mark Reisner's Cadillac Desert, which I highly recommend. But to summarize, the problem is this. The West used to be far wetter than it currently is. It once was ocean, and then it was swamp, and then it was glaciers, and then it was lakes. Now it is largely high desert. But water remains locked inside a massive aquifer underneath the surface of the Earth, a natural resource perhaps more valuable than any hydrocarbon, mineral, or tourist site. That actually isn't the problem. That would be just fine, except for the fact that massive expansion of urban areas and their growing populations descended from the continent's colonizers are sucking up all the water. Starting with a few desert rivers, they moved on to the lakes, then the artificial lakes made by damming the rivers, and now the aquifers. The cities are continuing to grow, but the water is going away. Lately, intensified by a regional drought, it is becoming clear that the water situation in the West is a ticking clock. The West isn't short on schemes to fix this problem. Schemes to fix the West have been ongoing ever since the 19th century when John Wesley Powell reported that less than 2% of the land was suitable for agricultural development. The story of the colonization of the West from the indigenous population is long and terrible and ongoing. And is the story of the colonization or the story of the colonization of water from its natural systems is also long, if slightly less terrible in isolation from its hand-in-hand -hand relationship to the colonization of the people. This is important to acknowledge, even if this paper does not delve into that history. But to do so, to refute the notion that this simply just happened. The end result remains that the West is now riven with artificial constructs designed to reclaim the land. At the behest of numerous public and private institutions, the water of the West is all now almost fully managed. That is to say, it is almost fully industrialized within an infrastructural network of pumps, canals, aqueducts, dams, reservoirs, power plants, and legal water rights that are bought and sold separately from property rights that require lawyers to untangle and understand. This is a system that is fraught with connections and disconnections. We might, as people venturing across the West, choose to make some connection with these systems. We don't have to do so. Almost entirely unlike land art, water infrastructure would be there whether or not anyone thought it would be worthwhile for people to come and look at it. Why go and look at water infrastructure? One answer is, how could you not? In order to not see water infrastructure, one either has to be ignorant of its existence or m maintain a particularly limited terrain. Not all water infrastructure is easy to see, of course. The pipes run under the street, the sewage treatment plants and reservoirs are kept out of sight in industrial areas, like much of infrastructure. But if one drives major interstate highways, crosses state lines, or travels over the edge of watersheds, one is going to see water infrastructure eventually. It's so omnipresent, it's unavoidable. But what is it that one is seeing? Water infrastructure is easy to see, but hard to know. The chain link fences, the dirt roads, the no trespassing signs, the unlabeled ditches and canals, the otherwise unremarkable reservoirs behind the hills, the electricity pylons, the squat blockhouses with pumps or treatment equipment, the aqueducts buried in dirt berms or in desert-colored pipe. There are thousands of miles of this infrastructure traced across the West, but who knows what they are? Where is the water coming from and where is it going? Which water is yours as opposed to simply being part of the managed totality? Even the most impressive sites of water infrastructure, like the Hoover Dam, do not really reveal what they are by imagery alone. They become a feature of an epic and awesome landscape, but what are they really? How are they related to the infrastructure we cannot see but rely upon every day? Who built them? Who maintains them today and with what money? What could exist instead of this monstrosity? What people could not exist if it wasn't for this infrastructure? 
What people were displaced to make this infrastructure possible? What was flooded beneath the water and who was buried beneath the earth? Yes, a map could help as long as it's paper because there's no data service out where much of this infrastructure is located. But a map isn't enough. A map's a diagram, a schematic representation of connections, like a map of the internet. It can tell you where you are and how to get to somewhere else, but a map does not answer any of the questions about what the infrastructure is or why it is. Visiting the infrastructure and looking at it can't tell you everything either. It can't tell you about how the Colorado River is being made ex exceedingly saline as salts build up in the flow from irrigation water that runs off the land and back to the river. You can see the effect of this salinity in the bleached rock of the reservoir banks exposed by drought, but you can't see the cause. You can't see the particles of salt that must be removed on a chemical level before the water reaches Mexico, or else it would kill the crops that it was sprayed onto there. You cannot see the glacial history of the aquifers or the generations of Native Americans who never lived to reside on the land where the water rights have now been sold to a city hundreds of miles distant. But what can, one can see the lack of connection. The distance that Lippard mentions is present. It's aesthetically available. One can see the separation forming, a rift gouged across the ecosystem. The infrastructure site separated from the land. The concrete poured over the dirt to prevent water from seeping through it. The fence thrown up around it. It's these features of distance that we respond to that help us orient what we know and what we don't know. One can see this distance in the aesthetic of water infrastructure sites. Just like the sheer oddity of Nancy Holt's smooth concrete tubes placed on an empty plateau in sun tunnels, we see the same in the smooth gradient line of an aqueduct cut across the face of a mountain like a scar, or in the impossibly straight river of an open aqueduct. Like in Heiser's levitated mass, a viaduct of impossibility, we see the same in the negating sight of water being made to run uphill. Like the smooth cut of James Terrell's rodent crater into a natural cinder cone, we see the machine plane plant free banks of a concrete levee. In the alien uniformity of the rods of Walter de Maria's lightning fields, the same regulated chaos of the pylons draping buzzing wires over the lips of canyons and across the widest open spaces. This distance is in the penstocks that take one river of water across another. In a sprinkler system, gushing water out onto a dry lake to abate the harmful dust only present because the water was removed from the lake to begin with. In the harsh distinction between dry hills and metal-enclosed rushing rivers, between the national, natural storm washes and a human-made river that flows in all seasons, we see this same distance. The water infrastructure of the West aspires to the same timelessness that land art seeks, if the motivation is different. It's not a reference to larger systems, but it's an effect to correct natural systems to our theory of how they ought to function. The inlaid artwork on the top of the Hoover Dam references astronomy, just like Ross's Star Atlas or Holt's Sun Tunnels. Cuts into the geological features are made to forever alter natural structures, like in Roden Crater and Star Axis, as in the diversion of the Owens River that feeds the LA Aqueduct. The works are at the mercy of the larger climate, just like Smithson's spiral jetty, submerged by the Great Salt Lake and then revealed again. And just like Lake Mead, descending downwards toward Deadpool and re revealing the salt it had deposited on the rocks of Black Canyon over the span of nearly a century. Despite these attempts to incarnate the infinite, infrastructure and land art are beholden to the limitations of time, expense, and political machinations, like the nearly 30-year ongoing process of building Michael Heiser's city complex, and the ongoing environmental battle over the fate of Owens Lake. These works are hard to get to, like lightning fields, which requires reservations and a $250 fee to the Dia Beacon. The LA Department of Water and Power, the Metropolitan Water District, the State of California's Department of Water Resources, and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation 
Normally make use of trespass, no trespassing signs, on the other hand, along with barbed wire and police patrols to maintain the pristine state of their installations. The one natural element that no land art can make, can, can make use of is fresh water. It's simply too expensive to be treated as an artistic medium. Water infrastructure, of course, pays for itself, even if it is mortgaging the future of the land by supporting urban growth that will eventually become unsustainable, or simply sending the bill to public taxpayers in order to supply affordable water to industrial and agricultural ratepayers. It's a business, and as infrastructure, it's industry. The difference between art and infrastructure is one of these breakages that makes itself apparent in the aesthetic appearance. At a certain point, their paths fork, and we see them part ways, with distance coming in between them. The existence of graded roads, maintenance facilities, the constant flow of white trucks bearing the logos of responsible management agencies, these all flock around infrastructure, and not art. Our apprehension of them both comes from the same place, but the knowledge that surrounds them are unique. The distance that surrounds them relate to them each individually, not to both at once. It's these sorts of stories that one picks up when one goes to visit water infrastructure. The aesthetic experience is front and center, but there are stories that remain hidden and unspoken. It's impossible to go and visit these places without beginning to learn a little bit about how they work. The aesthetics are the alarm bell. They attract us to something worth looking at, and from there, it's our responsibility to learn more. When Dono Haraway writes about situated knowledges to take the place of the God's eye view of our technology, it seems that this is what she means. It's less about studying the map and more about traveling out to the site so that the knowledge has real world vantage points as foundation on which to build. Surveying these sites is not just the job of the official engineer. It's also up to us as the people who these infrastructures were built to serve. We must do additional surveying that exists not in just quantitative modes to incorporate the vantage points that infrastructure would rather ignore. This is what land use is really about. One does not just draw a line in the soil or bury a pipe in the ground. Use is a continuing relationship, not simply a deed to water rights or an ineffaceable prospecting mark. The West is being used by us constantly, whether we acknowledge it or not. The aesthetic effect of infrastructure is anthropocenic, and therefore it belongs to us whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. It is important that we begin to explore what this use is really all about, and to seek out the aesthetic experience of distance, and to uncover the knowledges hiding within it. Thanks very much for listening.